afternoon, everybody. Sorry, clear your, your screen, please. The video. There we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for the Gastro Echo Foundation meeting today. Um, G Echo is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in um, association with Project Echo from the University of New Mexico. And just a reminder that these sessions are held each Wednesday. And today we're speaking about patient blood management and specifically the practical aspects related to iron therapy. And we've got the iron guy on the line today. So we're really, really lucky to have Vernon Lowe to speak to us about this fascinating topic. Today we excited because we've got 88 registrations and I can see that the numbers climbing as we speak. These registrations represent 13 countries on three continents. So this group is really getting big and the footprint is, is just getting bigger all the time. I want to urge you to make use of our exceptional speaker and the facilitators on this um, program today. And please, if you've got questions for Vernon, please use the chat box. And um, at the end of the session, we'll ask him to address those questions as they come up. Um, but keep them going through the chat and as you think of them, but we'll only answer them up at the end. So Vernon, welcome. And it's our privilege to listen to you to talk about this really practical topic. And I hope that you just demystify some of the aspects of iron therapy. Thank you, Vernon. Thanks very much, Claire, for that. Wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. And it's really a privilege to be with all of you here once again. I'm going to share my screen. And I hope you should be able to see it around about now. It's coming. I'm sure. Great. I trust that everyone is able to see my screen and hear me well. Okay. We can hear you well, Prof, and we're excited for you to get going. Thanks, Claire. With you around, can only go well. Okay, so I thought what we do today is talk a little bit more about the practical aspects of treatment of iron deficiency. And you as a group are a little bit of a, 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 a guinea pig group because I'm going to do some so show some slides that I've never shown before um, that I've made especially for this particular meeting. Uh, some of you who've heard me before will also hear things uh, that will be repetition, but especially when we get to the practical parts, um, I've got some stuff that I haven't done before. And, and, and maybe some of you can tell me afterwards what worked and what did not. I'm always trying to, to improve on this. So these are um, some of the groups that I've done work for, given talks for, and committees and stuff that I'm involved with around the world. Most of the things below are done for free. Uh, the things in the top line, I often get a consultancy fee for that. For today's session, this is all for free. So iron deficiency for me remains the number one health problem in the world um, after they say after dental problems which i do not treat um, although i sometimes have patients with that problem and um, it also remains one of the leading contributors to the global burden of disease i think this is something we don't always realize it's got a massive impact on quality of life as well as financially um, because you can see there that two to four billion people around the world are estimated to be iron deficient. It's by far the most common micronutrient deficiency. It's the cause of 50% of all anemias in the world. And it's also the most common hematological problem seen in pregnancy. So before we get to the practical aspects of treatment, we need to actually understand why we are treating. And this slide says it all. You know, if you ask me as a medical student, what are the symptoms of iron deficiency? I would have said to you, tiredness and pica, you know, because pica is one of those things that you hear about that always stands out. People who eat ice and clay and soil and all sorts, uh, that is usually quite interesting. 
But what we do not realize is that there are so many other important effects. And what I want you to also take home today is that all of the things you see on this list, first, please note how common they are. And second, you need to realize that you can have all of these even in the absence of anemia. So it's a big misunderstanding to think that iron deficiency only give you these very important symptoms if you are anemic. It's not true. I saw a patient this afternoon who is, who's got an HP that is normal and her, she is tired. She's not coping with the two children she's got at home. Her hair is falling out in bundles and all her symptoms are back. And when we tested her iron, indeed, that was low. And we're arranging an iron infusion for her because she doesn't respond to oral iron treatment. The, the reason why patients have all these symptoms, even in the absence of anemia, and for some reason my slides are not responding, but I'm sure they will now. There we go. Is that iron is not only needed for hemoglobin production. It's needed in every single cell of your body to do many things. It's involved in the as a cofactor in, in more than 100 enzymes. But specifically, it is necessary to make ATP, which is your primary molecule for energy. If you don't have ATP, you won't have energy, the cell won't function, and everything will grind to a halt. And this is why we've got this new term now. We call it non-anemic iron deficiency. Not that new anymore, but maybe it's new for some of, some of you here. Non-anemic iron deficiency, which needs to be recognized, <coughs> needs to be treated, as it can give you all the symptoms I've shown. How do we diagnose iron deficiency? I'm trying, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible for you. Let me see if I can get this out of the way. We start with the hemoglobin and serum ferritin. The hemoglobin is just to see how bad it is, not to decide whether the patient has iron deficiency. And then you look at the serum ferritin. And as I said, doesn't matter whether the hemoglobin is normal or low, if your serum ferritin is less than 30, we treat it as iron deficiency. Let's say the serum ferritin is between 30 and 100, then you need something more. And there we use the transferrin saturation. And if that is less than 20%, you treat it as iron deficiency. If the serum ferritin is more than 100, and I would say in most cases less than 600, and your saturation is less than 20%, you add something called the reticulocyte hemoglobin content. And if that is below normal, then your patient is likely to have iron deficiency. Now, I want to say something about this reticulocyte hemoglobin content because it's often misunderstood. It's not reticulocyte count. It's a specific new test that can only be done on some machines that, mo that all the labs do have, but you have to write it very clearly. Don't write reticular site count, although that might have a different meaning and might be of interest in a different way. Please write reticular site hemoglobin content. Don't forget B12 and folate deficiency. There are many things like PPIs, gastritis, gastrectomy that can give you multiple deficiencies simultaneously. Of course, we can't talk about iron without saying that you need to find the cause and blood loss is critically important. Uh, most common cause of iron deficiency would be in young menstruating women, women who've been pregnant, postpartum hemorrhage, but don't forget gastrointestinal tract. Any patient over the age of 45, you need to consider gastroscopy and colonoscopy. Blood donors, up to two thirds of blood donors are iron deficient. They need to be replaced. And these days, both Sandvis and the Western Cape Blood Service are giving replacement iron to their donors, which is fantastic. And then always take a good bleeding history. Von Willebrand's disease is common. It's uh, seen in one to 2% of people, but we don't test for it, we don't think about it. But if you have a young woman with heavy menstruation, especially if there's a family history of the same, 
do think of it and test for it. And I want to say this, heavy menstrual bleeding is really important. One third to a half of all adolescents suffer with it. And I say suffer because it's really a big problem for sport, for sleeping, for just functioning, and it leads to iron deficiency. Only one third will actually go to their GP in a three-year period, but that's still a, a lot, I guess. But this is a one third of all young women will actually need to go to their GP. And 5% will end up in ICU, typically with HPs of two, HPs of three, which we commonly see. And that's what we're trying to avoid, of course. I want to just show this if, if some of you haven't seen this before. It's a very nice set of questions published by Dugan in anesthesia last year. If you've had, if you answer yes to any one of these four questions, uh, five questions, actually four questions, the first four, that means that the patient's got menorrhagia. It's always a difficulty, and I think for men and male doctors, it might be more difficult to, to think about this or understand this, but this is easy. If the patient has flooding through clothes or bedding, need frequent changes of their towels or tampons, meaning every two hours or less, or 12 sanitary items in total per, per period, in other words, over the whole menstrual period. If they need double protection, they, for instance, need tampons and towels, or if they're passing large blood clots. Any of those, any one of those would mean that the patient's got menorrhagia and needs to be looked at perhaps by a gynecologist or a GP or someone with experience in managing that. We mentioned already that a gynae evaluation in women with heavy menstrual bleeding, especially in postmenopausal women would be important, but all men with iron deficiency, uh, all men and women over 45, should be investigated with gastroscopy and colonoscopy and also consider it in younger people with changed bowel habits of unknown cause where there's no clear other alternative cause of bleeding or even where you worried about these bowel, bowel problems. Maybe Prof Cassinides can say something about that later. I want to show this slide and the next one just to explain how frequently you find something if you do a gastroscopy in these patients. I'm talking about these 45 year pluses, not the young menstruating women. 33% of patients will have significant, a significant lesion, which could be anything from a peptic ulcer to a malignancy. And if you look at that, 9%, one in 10 will have a peptic ulcer. One in 25 will have a gastric cancer or some, some upper GI cancer. If you do a colonoscopy in that group, 9% will have cancer and 11% will have a high-risk adenoma. But 53, one in two people, will actually have a lesion. So this patient I saw this afternoon, she came to me with a history of heavy menstrual bleeding two years ago. We treated her. She's seen by the gynecologist. She, the, the menstrual bleeding was sorted out. But she had changed bowel habits and she's um, 38 years old and you know i was not very happy with her and i sent her for gastroscopy and colonoscopy it turned out that she had a uh, significant gastritis with bleeding and an important colonic polyp in a 38 year old with a history of heavy menstrual bleeding but in her case um, it was the bowel the change in bowel habits that really worried me and uh, also some upper GI symptoms. So, so take a careful history. Don't just jump to, to conclusions too quickly. So we are here for practical things about treatment today. So let's start with prevention. So if we think of prevention, we first need to just think a little bit about the physiology of iron. And, and the important things here would be to remember that a Western diet, a good healthy Western diet, contains about 10 to 20 milligrams of iron, but you absorb only 10% of that. Heme iron is absorbed best, about 30%, while inorganic iron that you find more in vegetables is very poorly absorbed. So heme iron, that's easy. That's any forms of meat, but red meat would be your best source. The non-heme iron that you find in all kinds of vegetables and grains and so forth, 
you, you, you often see that they mention that there's a lot of iron theoretically in these things, but absorb, absorption is typically a major problem. So look at this slide, for instance, you can see in red, uh, or the total bar, bar size, size represents the total iron, and the blue, the absorbed iron. Look at spinach, you know, we all taught as children to eat our spinach like Popeye, but there's a lot of iron in there, but very little that comes, comes into the body. And I always show, show this slide because I think it tells a story. How much spinach do you need to eat to just meet your daily needs? And the answer is, if you go and calculate it, between two and a half and four and a half kilos, not grams, kilos. You know, one would wish it was grams when you were, when you were a child. <laughs> the reality is it's a bucket full. So vegetarians, vegans, and people who take in a limited amount of meat are, are certainly at risk of developing iron deficiency. And the other thing is, we need to remember that iron is really blocked by every possible thing almost that goes around. And, and a, a nice way to remember this is to think of a continental breakfast. Everything in a continental breakfast almost blocks iron absorption, whether it's the phosphates, tannates, phytates, etc., in the cereal, the calcium in the milk, or in the calcium supplement you're taking for your osteoporosis, the tea, the coffee, uh, tea and coffee both decrease absorption by 50%. Eggs contain something called phosphatin, which blocks iron absorption. The only good thing at breakfast for iron is the meats, if you have meat for breakfast, you know. So that's why iron sulfate, for instance, need to be, needs to be taken on an empty stomach. Fortunately, we've got new iron formulations now uh, that you can take with food, but make sure you know which one can be taken in which way. So keep your tea and patients tea and coffee for tea time. Don't let them have their iron supplements. If it's iron sulfate with breakfast, it has to be had on an empty stomach. Uh, and if you want to give things with food, make sure it's the, the right thing. This is uh, fortunately not something I'm uh, doing at the moment, but people are getting more and more excitable, uh, excited about edible insects as a source for iron and zinc. But I think that's future music. That's not for now. Uh, vitamin C in your food might increase absorption by 50%. You don't need much. You can you don't even need a supplement. You can use a small glass of orange juice, not even 200 moles. It's usually enough um, if, it's a, if it's real orange juice. But even eating orange-rich fruits, if they've not been in cold storage for too long, um, would give you enough vitamin C. Other practical things um, that's been used more and more around the world is, is something like the uh, lucky iron fish. Um, they use these so-called, they call these ingots, I-N-G-O-T-S, and you put them in the pot and they can last for about five years and it adds iron to the food. So if you're like me and you've got uh, a wife and three daughters, all who need iron supplements, it's a nice thing to add to add to the food um, and make sure there's a little bit extra iron just in the diet. So that's all prevention. Now, how about treatment? So one of the things that I give, that I talk about in one of my other lectures, and I'm just gonna summarize it here, is that when you have infection, inflammation, uh, cancer, renal failure, your body produces this hormone called hepcidin, which basically blocks iron absorption as well as iron uh, recycling from stores in the liver, from macrophages in the spleen, and from macrophages in the bone marrow. So if you don't have iron, you won't be able to get it in. If you do have iron in the stores or recycled iron, you won't be able to get it out into the circulation to be um, carried to the bone marrow, which is a factory of blood to be made into blood or to be used anywhere else. But if you have simple iron deficiency, i.e. you don't have inflammation, infection, recent surgery, cancer, etc., the hepcidin levels are low. And these patients can be treated quite cheaply with oral iron. And the adv advantages, of course, is that it's convenient. It's generally not that expensive. 
and the more let's say the more modern ions i'm not talking about iron sulfate are reasonably well tolerated the problems is if you use ferrous sulfate and sometimes even with the others um, patients um, you need to depend on the patient's ability to adhere compliance is maybe a bit of a harsh word these days uh, to keep on taking the, the medication many of them get gastrointestinal side effects i'll say something about that in a moment and you're also dependent on good iron absorption and uh, there might be inflammation or HIV or something that you're not aware of that causes that inflammatory response and blocks iron uptake. You need to treat the patient for at least three months. And in a patient who's, who's anemic, it could often take three months easily to get their HP normal uh, with oral iron, but then you need to still treat them, continue to treat them until they have completely filled up their iron stores for the next pregnancy or um, whatever might be in their future. Uh, there's a lot of interactions with foods and medicines, which one needs to be aware of. And you have to take a careful history to see if you can close the tap, stop the bleeding. If there's an absorption problem, celiac disease, for instance, that you can manage that and sort that out. So it's, it's, it's nice to think of the history of, of the treatment of iron deficiency. And it all started with uh, Thomas Seidenham, who was uh, called the English Hippocrates. He made such a, a great contribution to medicine in general, but he's also considered the father of clinical hematology. And he was the first one to describe the use of iron or steel filings uh, steeped in cold Rhenish wine. I'm not sure if that's the reason why his own cheeks are looking a bit red there. Uh, and this was to treat what they called the green sickness already as long as far back as 1687. And he, he described how uh, in a particular patient, you can see this is a man with enthusiasm. The steel was begun with at once. It sounds like you're going to run a hundred meters, but nevertheless, and after 30 days of so-called steel, uh, the pulse gained strength and frequency, the surface uh, uh, warmth, and the face was no longer pale and death-like and of a fresh and ruddy color. So a man that's quite excited and um, sorry, I just want to tell my wife I can't talk right now. Um, if, if she phones again, I'm going to answer. Um, but then Pierre Blord of Bouquer in France actually made the first iron tablets. Now these things were like cannonballs. If you look at the amount of iron they contain per tablet, I mean, that's like unbelievable. It's anything from 100 to... Uh, probably 40 times what we use in, in iron tablets these days, but uh, massive doses of iron. But what I found fascinating is how they uh, marketed these so-called Dr. Blord's capsules. Now, if you ever saw a Marty, um, an advertisement that was far from the truth, it was this one. Let's just look what he says, a valuable tonic for ladies. These capsules produce pure, rich blood without any disagreeable effects and are recommended by the medical faculty as the best remedy for bloodlessness. Now, that was a few hundred years ago. And that in, without any disagreeable effects, I'm not sure how the so-called ladies in this uh, advertisement felt about this. But the reality is that although oral iron is effective for most patients and the costs are low, uh, and serious side effects are rare, the less serious side effects are annoying and common. They may be gastrointestinal, but seen in up to 70% of patients. Constipation is common, uh, often much, much worse if you use oral iron in pregnancy because you've already got other issues there. But there's lots of stuff, diarrhea, pain, nausea, vomiting, etc. And quietly, the patient stops taking it. And you must really ask your patient every time, have you been able to tolerate it? If not, tell me about it and make an alternative plan. I warn the patients up front to tell, let me know if they're not tolerating it. I say many people don't tolerate it, but there are good alternatives. If you don't tolerate it, let me know and I will make a plan for you. Also remember that for iron to be absorbed, 
you need a mildly acidic medium. So if you use antacids or proton pump inhib inhibitors, that's going to give you problems with iron absorption. So if you take iron in, in, with an antacid or a PPI, you've got to take it either two hours before or four hours after. We've already mentioned vitamin C, which could be taken as a small glass of orange juice. Just remember that a patient who's had a complete gastrectomy, you know, they're not going to absorb iron at all. You can forget it. Don't even think of giving them oral iron. They've got to go straight to an alternative that bypasses the stomach, like an IV iron, for instance. Enterocoated irons, not a good idea. Terribly absorbed. Ferrous sulfate, empty stomach, one hour before or two hours after a meal. Not always practical. People don't like it, but I can assure you it will because we use this in state, it's something they don't like at all. Now, what are your challenges here with oral iron? It could, it's often inadequate in patients with severe ongoing blood loss. We run a, a clinic with a bleeding disorder clinic where many patients, we can't get control of the bleeding, so you support them regularly with iron. And in some instances, some of these patients really do need um, IV iron. I'm thinking for the hematologists of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, where we now have a large cohort of patients in a multidisciplinary clinic with normal HVs, because we give them, we push IV iron every 14 days even in some of these. I said before, you, it might take months of oral iron to get everything back to optimal. And the total costs, if you multiply the monthly cost of a non-ferrous sulfate iron uh, with a number of months, that might even be higher than giving IV iron. So just think about those, those things. How can you improve the efficacy and tolerability? Well, you can change maybe to a liquid iron or to a to some uh, nice powders and or um, go away, move away from enterocoated. Do not give it in patients who's already got inflammatory bowel disease. You'll make it worse especially at active inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, you don't want to do that. Uh, previous bariatric surgery, um, that could be a problem. If it's only a gastric banding, that's fine and can work. And change your dosing schedule. And this is really something important. In the past, we used to use oral iron twice or even three times a day. Um, and I'm now, now I have to to just emphasize this, here I am talking about ferrous sulfate, which we use in state. Nowadays, we use it in this way. So they've done these studies showing that if you use something like ferrous sulfate every second day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, patients respond better with less side effects. Okay. If you use some of the more modern ions, like iron polymaltose or sucrosomyl iron, those can be taken. Um, sorry, let's just go to my next slide. It's too many slides now. If you use these new formulations, they can one be taken with food and they are taken, they can be taken daily. Okay, so these can still be taken daily, but we don't use them more than once a day anymore. So as a general rule, if you use iron, use it once a day. If you use ferrous sulfate, give the patient two tablets, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You'll have less side effects and much better adherence. What can you expect? Well, symptoms like pagophagia will go away almost immediately. Patient will feel better within days. The anemia, you can expect to improve with an HP increase of around one to two grams per deciliter every week to a week and a half. So HP should go up by two every three weeks and most will normalize the HP within six weeks if it's not too severe, but depends on where you start. You know, if you start with an HP of seven, it's gonna take nine weeks. If you start with an HP of two or three, it's gonna take much longer. Um, just remember that you're going to have to, after the HP is normal, you still have to replenish the stores. When do we switch to IV iron? Well, as I said before, hydrochloric acid is critical to dissolve iron from food. So if a patient has had a, a complete gastrectomy, even a, a, a significant gastrectomy or atrophic gastritis, is, a gastritis as seen in the elderly and pernicious anemia, or they're on PPIs, you're going to have problems. 
The same is true if there are diseases of the small bowel, like celiacs or inflammatory bowel, they're not going to be able to absorb it. If you have any condition increasing hepcidin levels, as mentioned here, um, that could cause problems with absorption. And which means that with hepcidin blocking, oral iron absorption will be blocked and you're going to have to consider an alternative, either IV iron or something like sucrosomial iron that can be absorbed hepcidin independent. So I think I'm going to just summarize this and as you're going to go to the next slide and say, so when do we move to IV iron? Well, first, if, you're, if you've had an inadequate response to oral iron, for whatever reason, you, you switch to IV. If, you don't, if your patient doesn't tolerate oral iron, you switch to IV. If you don't have enough time to wait, for those of you who've listened to my talk about um, iron deficiency in pregnancy, you'll remember that if a patient is iron deficient in the second or third trimester, you have to, you have to, you have to sort it out there and then. You can't wait until after the pregnancy because the baby will have permanent neurocognitive problems that's going to last as far as we know now, for at least 20 to 25 years, not months, weeks, or days, years. You have to sort it out. And oral iron, if you don't have enough time, you have to give the IV iron right there. Patients who come for preoperatively pre and you, you can't delay the surgery, you need to treat the, the anemia, and it's iron deficiency related, you give IV iron. We give it with erythropoietin in renal failure. And then, as I mentioned, if a patient can't, absorb it for whatever reason, you need to bypass the system and you can use IVI. There are contraindications. We don't give it to patients with a true allergy, and I'm going to come back to that word true allergy. We obviously don't want to give it to patients who are iron overloaded. If the, if the patient is anemic from another reason, we can't give it. There's been a study that's made a lot of noise where Patients did not respond to IV iron. There was no significant benefit seen preoperatively. The problem with that trial was they gave it to all anemic patients. They didn't differentiate. It's not meant to be given for a patient with anemia from B12 deficiency or anemia from hemolytic anemia or thalassemia. That is just doesn't make sense. You know, it's a specific thing for a specific problem. Okay, now I've ranted enough about that. First trimester pregnancy, nobody knows whether it's safe. And so nobody gives it in first trimester. And there were some animal studies where they were worried about the animal's uh, development in first trimester, uh, bone development, things like that. So we don't give it in first trimester. Decompensated liver cirrhosis, hepatitis, uh, or porphyria cutanea tarda, iron can precipitate problems, you don't give it. Active rheumatoid arthritis, not rheumatoid arthritis, active rheumatoid arthritis would be a contraindication and acute renal failure. Uh, most patients with chronic renal failure are going to be on iron, so it's not meant to say no patients. Okay, so there are some, some package insert or label specific contraindications that you'll find is a little bit different from one to the other. I'm not exactly sure why, but nevertheless, it is what it is. Um, if the, some people say significant history of asthma, eczema, or atopy, others say a history of. So I'm just going to say what the labels in South Africa say. History of asthma, eczema, and atopic allergy is mentioned in the Cosmofer and Ferenjek uh, package inserts. In the Ferenjek as a caution, in the Cosmofer as a contraindication, it's not mentioned in the Monofer. Acute or chronic infection is only mentioned in the monofer and the pharyngeic ones as a caution. Again, I think generally speaking, speaking, we will be uh, careful in these patients. What are the advantages of intravenous iron? Well, many of the colleagues who've been around for a while will remember that the, so the old high molecular weight iron dextrans gave a lot of anaphylaxis. That is no longer the case with the low molecular ones like Cosmofer and the non-dextran ones like ferricarboxymaltose or iron isomaltoside. I'll come back to the risks there. 
The other advantage is that some of these newer ones, like the latter two, can be given over a very short period of time. And even within one hour, you can give your total dose infusion. And for many patients, it can be done in one or two sittings. It's very effective. You've got no adherence problems. You need to give the patient all they need to, to, to sort out their HP and their stores. You do it. There's no problems with adherence. When it's in, it's in. And you get a faster, more predictable response at oral iron. We've got lots of studies comparing IV to, to oral. It's really, really um, very effective. And of course, much cheaper than using blood. And I want to remind everyone about patient blood management. We use blood to resuscitate. And when we use blood, we typically use one unit at a time, unless you've got a massive bleeding problem. One unit, the so so-called single unit transfusion, is the modern way of giving blood. You do not order two or three or four or whatever. Um, if there's one thing that you can change your life, your practice, and your patients' lives, you start by doing by using less blood. Only give it when it's really necessary. If a patient comes in with an HP of three, and they stable, and they walking in. I'm not talking about a patient half conscious on the trolley. I'm talking about a patient walking in and they are re reasonably, they are okay, they're tired, but they are managing. You put them in a bed, you give them IV iron and you monitor them. If they're unstable, you give them one unit of blood. If you give them too much, you'll fluid overload them and you can kill them. This is actually how, you, how many patients with severe B12 deficiency are actually killed by doctors. Because by the, if they walk in, it means they've compensated. How do they compensate? By expanding their plasma volume. If you now give them a transfusion, you put them into pulmonary edema immediately because you take them from an HP of 3 to 4.5 within a few hours and their body can't tolerate the extra volume load. So you need to be extra careful. If you're going to do it, you need to give them diuretics. You need to really be there. Don't give it at night if you can, can avoid it because you're going to run into troubles. So let's focus on a few practicalities around IV iron formulations. You'll see that I'm focusing on these three. Iron uh, dextran, which is cosmopher, iron isomaltoside, which is monopher, and ferric carboxymaltose, which is ferinject. Right. Why don't I mention venopher? One, because I never use it, OK? Uh, because I believe it's a big waste of money in most instances to use not, I'm not, not only venous, for any iron sucrose in a small amount, because the most patients need at least 500 milligrams. So now they've got to come for multiple doctor's visits because you're not allowed to give more than 200 milligrams at a time. It's good for the doctor's bank account. It's bad for the patient's medical aid and their savings plan, et cetera. So iron sucrose also has more side effects and more reactions than the others. So there is a place for it, and that place is mainly in chronic renal disease and a few other limited indications. As a general rule, I don't really recommend it. These others are all great, and I'm going to give you a few practical tips. The first question I'm often asked, how do I calculate the dose? You know, should I use the Ganzoni formula? So you'll see many package inserts or all the package inserts will probably give you this Canzoni formula. So you calculate how much the patient needs and then you get to some value of 546 milligrams or something like that, or 1,322 and you're not always sure what to do. If you wanna use it, let me quickly explain how this works. And for those who love maths, this is maybe nice. So the total iron dose in milligrams that your patient needs is going to be the body weight in kilos times the target HP minus the current HP. And most of them would say you use as a target an HP of 15 minus the actual HP. Let's say that is now 10. So 10 minus 15 minus 10 is 5. Now it's body weight times 5 times 2.4 plus Iron for iron stores. Now, what's that? That's a difficult question because what is normal iron stores? It's somewhere between 500 and 1,000. 
So depending on who you read, they will say, make that 500 or make that 1,000. I personally make that typically 500. If the patient's HP is normal at the moment, then target HP minus actual HP is going to be zero. So zero times body weight times 2.4 remains zero. So then you only, you're only left with the iron stores. Now for me, that is typically 500. That's in my practice. There are simplified ways of doing these things now, okay? And these are the way things are used mostly around the world. And I think it's a more cost-effective way of doing it because you're going to uh, round it off to the nearest vial size and you use weight. And you can see at the top, for instance, this is for ferry inject, ferry carboxymaltose. If the HP is less than 10, you're obviously going to need more, um, but you can now on a weight basis go and say how much you need. Uh, and then if the HP is a bit higher, what then? If they've got so-called NAID or non-anemic iron deficiency, in other words, they're just iron deficient, there's no anemia, it's 500, like I just explained. Same with iron dextran and iron isomaltoside, cosmophen monifer. Uh, depending on your patient's weight, that's the doses you, you can give. And it's nice to have these things, have a little flip file in your rooms where you've got all these things ready and at hand. And I know all these companies have very nice little flyers that they hand out that shows all these things. So you can use you can use those. How do you give the infusion? Now this is, it's important to note that these infusions are not all the same. And you don't give every single one of them in the same way. You don't even mix them in the same way. And sometimes we might forget that. So I'm just going to run through this because I think that these are the practicalities, the day-to-day -day things. So with Cosmofer, you can use saline and 5% glucose or dextrose water, but these are the only diluents you can use, nothing else. You do need a test dose. You put 25 milligrams in 100 mils of saline and you run it over 15 minutes, then you wait 45 minutes, okay? Then you infuse the remainder of the dose. Let's say you need a dose more than 500 or a total dose infusion to a max of 20 mils per kilo. You dilute it in 500 mils. Now, okay, biggest mistake made, biggest mistake made. People give these ions in more than 500 mils. Or in the case of ferroject, as you'll see, in more than 250 mils max. You must not dilute it too much. Sometimes we think, ah, to avoid a reaction, I'm going to dilute it more. The more you dilute it, the more unstable it becomes, the more reactions your patients get. So you must uh, respect the maximum dilution, okay? If your total dose exceeds the maximum, so let's go back, you know, let's say you calculate the 20 milligrams per kilos, and it works out to be... Um, 2,500, or let's say it works out, uh, yeah, 2,500 milligrams or 2,000 milligrams for a patient weighing 50. And you want to give um, ferroinject. You can see here, you need 1,500 milligrams. So you can't give the 2,500 at once. You've got to give uh, the 1,500 the one time and maybe the other 1,000 the next time, and the same with the others. Right, so... When you give the remainder, uh, you finish your test out, you start with a 20 drop per mole dropper at 45 drops per minute, you increase the rate and you run the whole infusion over four to six hours. And once you're done with that, you observe the patient for another 60 minutes, right? Doesn't matter what iron you give. Okay, I, on the left, you see Cosmofet. It's actually for everything. Doesn't matter what iron. You always have to have an emergency trolley with adrenaline one in a thousand dilution ready, always there, not drawn up, but in the, it's there. It's just available if you need it. You can't mix IV ions with other medicines and quickly throw in a few other stuff there in the, in the infusion while you add it. With Cosmofer, if you give it too rapidly and sometimes with some of the others as well, you can have hypertension, although the others this is less of a problem. Do not use oral iron and IV iron simultaneously. 
because when you give just after you've given the IV iron, the body reacts by blocking absorption of oral iron. So you usually have to wait about five days, but we don't typically need it. You know, if you give enough IV iron, you sort it. But let's say you do have a patient with some bleeding problem and it's always oozing, oozing, and you have to give the IV iron too frequently and you want to give oral iron, just wait five days after your infusion. What about monofer? That's now iron isomaltoside. Now, look at this, it's very important. I said with a cosmofer, you can mix it with saline or 5% dextrose. Monofer, you can't, only saline. Nothing else. The maximum dilution, 500 mils. Otherwise, the nanoparticles become unstable and you're going to have problems. You also need a test dose of 25 milligrams. If there's no reaction after 60 minutes, you can infuse the rest. You can give up to 20 milligram per kilogram in a, sec in, in a single visit. If your maximum dose is exceeded, you give the maxi maximum allowed dose at visit one and you give the rest at visit two. And again, round off to the nearest vial size to make sure you don't waste. And if your, your infusion rate is titrated in this instance to the dose. If you have less than 1,000 milligrams, you infuse, or up to 1,000, you give over 15 to 30 minutes, so that's nice and quick. If it's more than 1,000, you give over 30 to 60 minutes, and you've got to observe the patient for another half an hour after. Um, if blood is drawn within four hours of the infusion, you might see that the serum could be brown in color. It's not dangerous, it's just to know about it. And it can sometimes, in that early phase, falsely increase serum bilirubin and falsely decrease serum calcium levels. So just keep that in mind. And there might be a transient increase in liver enzymes. Ferinject um, or ferric carboxymaltose, again, um, I've already shown you the, the doses, but you're going to have a test dose where you run the infusion, uh, depending on how much you give for either one minute or 30 seconds, it's a very short time, then you observe the patient for 15 minutes. If there's no reaction, you give the rest, typically over 15 minutes. And here I summarize it all for you, and let me just quickly run through it. So all of them need a test dose. All of them plus minus 25 milligrams. I think Ferringex package insert says 20 to 30. I've just changed it to 25. I think it's easier to remember. Here's a waiting time for each. And there's specific diluents. You can't just use anything you like. And there's a maximum volume diluent. Now, note what I say at the top. This is for doses of 500 milligrams or greater. Because I, I personally never use them in lower doses. You can use them in lower doses. If you do, then your maximum volume might decrease. So check the package insert. Total dose infusion is typically, you can give total dose infusions for everyone. Um, it's 20 milligrams per kilogram for the first two. The current package insert for Ferinject is 15. It's being updated based on new data to 20 as well. And I believe it's going to be out around July, we hope. Infusion time, there we go. Four to six hours for Cosmofer, 15 to 60 for Monofer, 15 for Ferinject. Right, what about adverse effects? Just to say first, gastrointestinal adverse events in all these studies put together, meta-analysis, half with, I, with IV iron compared to oral iron. So much, much better tolerated. Anaphylaxis, very rare. Somewhere between one in 10,000 to one in 200,000. There's a recent retrospective study that suggests maybe one in 2,500 to one in 200,000. Not always clear whether it was true anaphylaxis or another reaction that I'll get to now. Nevertheless, even though it's rare and you might never see a case in your life, you must remember to have your emergency trolley there and that patients with anaphylaxis history, asthma or drug allergies are at high risk. There's something called the fish vein reaction, as per the name of the person who reported it in 96. Now, this is much more common. It's uh, not serious, but it's seen in one in 200 patients. They get arthrologists, myologists, flushing, 
without the typical features of a severe asthma or anaphylaxis, such as hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, wheezing, strider, or edema, periorbital edema. For this one, you don't need to do anything. You can just stop the infusion, wait till the symptoms go away, then start again. If your patient reacts twice, you can change the iron formulation. It's not something to treat with antihistamines. Triptase levels will be normal, and they found that antihistamines have placed put more people in ICU if given in IV iron infusions than anaphylaxis. So the side effects of antihistamine is a bigger problem than the risk of anaphylaxis. There are nice things like this that you could use to help guide you when you get a reaction. Again, have that in your flip file or against the wall. Um, and this guides you as to, depending on how mild, moderate, or severe it is, what you can do, how you can treat it, and how you can stop and start. And I'm sure um, if you speak to, to, if you either contact me, I can um, um, let you know what the, uh, the article is, where this comes from. But that's very useful. Then there are also so-called late reactions, which can happen within four to 48 hours. Again, joint pains, muscle pains, maybe some swollen nodes, fevers, chills, dizziness, headache, malaise, or nausea, vomiting. These usually mild, usually go uh, away spontaneously, but they can sometimes be bad. I have one patient that had quite severe pain that I had to give intravenous paracetamol to make her feel better. Um, but mostly responds well to panados and an anti-inflammatory if there's no contraindication and goes away in three to four days. But it's more common in patients with inflammatory joint disease. And like, you know, that's why we mentioned earlier, don't give it to patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. It's also more common with larger doses in smaller patients. And it's twice as common in females compared to men. What are the targets of your therapy? Well, of course, you want to optimize the HP and iron stores, which means you want to get the ferritin to above 100. The ferritin, you can, you can typically multiply your ferritin with 10 in a patient who doesn't have inflammation or HIV or cancer or TB or something like that, and that will give you the iron stores. So ferritin of 50 means the patient's got about 500 milligrams of stores, Ferritin of 100 gives you 1,000. Why is that important? Because for every pregnancy, a woman needs 1,000 milligrams of iron for that particular pregnancy. So that will set her up for a good pregnancy. So that's your targets. So in conclusion, iron deficiency is super common. You can have all the symptoms without being anemic. Uh, anemia is really the end stage of iron deficiency. If you understand the pathophysiology, that will help you understand the diagnosis and treatment. And I think, and I hope you, I could uh, show you that IV iron, uh, which was my focus today, is generally safe and very effective. So with that, I'm handing over, uh, or just before I hand over to Claire, I'm just going to advertise my YouTube channel, where there are lots of videos on iron that you can go and watch. And you can also contact me, email me if you want to join our patient blood management group where we share a lot of tips and tools and new articles on um, iron and patient blood management. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vernon, for fascinating us and really just giving us a, a whirlwind tour, but with beautiful little stops of practical pockets of information. And that one of the things I love about your talks is that there's always a message that you can take home. And we are really so privileged to have had you sharing with us today. Thank you for that. Thank you, Claire. Um, there are, I see Chris is clapping ferociously in the background as well. Um, I see that everybody's embraced this thing as the opportunity of a lifetime must be taken in the lifetime of an opportunity. And the questions are flooding in <laughs> while they've got you. And I know we've only got five minutes now. So I'm going to start, um, and maybe just opening up the questions on the chat box. The first question was, um, can a um, reticulocyte hemoglobin be done in the state sector? Specifically, the question was at Grutisky Hospital. Can, that be, can a reticulated hemoglobin be done there? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so so in the, the reticulocyte hemoglobin content is available at Grutisky. And I hope if it's 
part of the NHRS that it would be available elsewhere as well. So just check your lab if you're not um, at Grutteskeer. But yes, we do it uh, well daily, probably multiple times a day. We 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 do it now, and uh, it's it's very useful. Then Marius Wasserfall has got a very practical question. So he asks if you can comment on iron studies when you test fasting versus non-fasting. And he shares a bit of a practical experience there that perhaps you can see in the chat box. But he was saying, should iron studies always be done in a fasting state? Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so, so ferritin, if you use ferritin as a screening test, uh, fasting is not critical. But uh, if you do complete iron studies, then it is important. So for an accurate transfusion, uh, transferrin saturation, the patient needs to be fasting for 12 hours. Uh, I think it's one of the tips I shared on the PBM group in the last uh, few days. Um, remember that. And also, uh, I, I had a GP that came to listen to one of my talks and she's, she was iron deficient and she says she's really got these discrepant iron uh, study results. She's got this symptom, she really feels bad but the transferrin saturation was 87%. So I asked her if it was taken fasting. She said no. And on top of that, she was actually taking her, taking her iron supplements. Mm -hmm. And the iron supplement taken in the morning is going to affect your, um, your, your transferrin saturation value and might give you a falsely raised or falsely normal value. And we've had a couple of these type of cases. So, so that is important. The other thing, Marius, is, of course, that um, hepcidin has got a diurnal variation. It's lowest in the morning. So your, your, your iron is absorbed best in the morning and it's highest in the evening. Now, sometimes we do say if you really don't tolerate it in the morning, use it in the evening and hopefully sleep through your side effects. But um, there could be a problem with absorption doing it that way. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I hope that answered the question. It sounds like it would have. Um, John Ross asked a question, what about giving intravenous iron postoperatively? So the example he states is a hemodynamically stable patient who is perhaps post ectopic pregnancy or uterine evacuation and is bled down to an HB of 5.5. She doesn't need a transfusion, but do you think that there'd be a role for giving intravenous iron to help with the rapid um, recovery of the hemoglobin post-op? Sure, absolutely. So with every unit of blood you lose, you lose about 250 to 300 milligrams worth of iron that would have eventually been recycled um, from those red blood cells that are now lost immediately and they need to be replaced. So um, if you think about the fact that one unit of blood usually pushes up your HP by 1 to 1.5, this patient has really lost a lot of blood. So she's going to benefit from intravenous iron and it will certainly speed up the recovery. As a matter of fact, if you do not give it, you'll probably see a delay. The other challenge is that uh, in the immediate post-operative phase, your ferritin might be falsely normal and high. So it's not gonna be that easy to make the diagnosis. So sometimes we just have to use our common sense and say, and I've had a patient like this today in the public sector, just like this. Um, and it was also in the um, postpartum phase, two weeks after. And um, I said, give IV iron. So I think this is a nice question. Thank you, John. Um, and certainly, I think there's value there. Then there's a question of um, whether one can administer both oral and intravenous or parenteral iron at the same time. Yeah, so, so um, I alluded to that in, in one of my slides to say that in the immediate post-infusion phase, the um, iron absorption is going to block, be blocked. So you've got to wait about five days before you give oral iron again. Now, generally speaking, I would say 99% of my patients, I do not add oral iron. But I do have a few who need such frequent um, infusions of IV iron that I actually do ask them to take oral iron in between to just help compensate for ongoing bleeding loss that cannot be stopped. But that's the exception. Okay. Good. Um, there was also a question of whether you would be willing to share your slides. So some of my talks are already available online. And uh, 
if you email me, I can give you some links to the videos. This particular one, I'm in the busy of in the process of refining. As I said, you guys are the guinea pigs in the first to year, year this talk in this way. So um, in future, we might upload this. But at the moment, I'm, most of the slides that you saw today is on a video that I've already made and that I've shared on the PBM group and that I'm happy to share with others. There's a couple of videos that I've made half an hour each. And the one that I've actually based this one on, most of this is a half an hour talk that you can listen to. And those videos are excellent. I can recommend that everybody take the time to watch them. Then I've got a question, if I can use my prerogative as the chair. Um, and that's about hypophosphatemia after intravenous iron therapy. And that seems to be something that people are talking about now. And, you know, whether this is something that's isolated only to iron carboxymaltose, or is it something that is a general class effect? And what should we do with this information? I'm, my concern is, is it going to make people frightened of giving intravenous iron? And yeah, yeah. so what would you advise? Hmm. So... I'm not afraid of it at all. Um, I think the, the scare mongering, if I can put it this way, came from an article that was published in a way someone, I don't know how they did this, but they gave a patient 28 IV iron infusions or something in a two year period, which is too much. Mm. So the, it is true that a percentage of patients can develop hypophosphatemia after infusion um, it's, it's been described um, with a um, pharynget primarily, but also seen in about 4% of patients uh, with monofer. It's usually mild, sometimes moderate, almost always asymptomatic. But if you're going to give lots of IV iron infusions to a particular patient, which is really the exception, then a chronic long-standing hypophosphatemia can cause osteomalacia. Okay, so it's not something that happens with a single dose significantly. If you have a patient known with hypophosphatemia for whatever other reason, well, that's a different story, then you have to carefully monitor. I do not do routine phosphate levels on any of my patients, I have to admit. Okay. Which probably tells you I've, how, how worried I am about it. <laughs> um, just see that we're going over time, Vernon, and just for respect of everybody's time, sure. I'm going to, I'd, I want to ask, can, um, Elzan has got a follow-up question on her um, ectopic pregnancy case. Have you got time to answer that? Or? Um, let me see, is it in the chat? It's in the chat. So she asks, um, a follow-up question on the topic pregnancy. Could one consider referring to the reticulocyte hemoglobin content? Would it respond so quickly? Or would there be a lag in reticulocyte response? Okay, just a, uh, could one consider referring to... Yeah, so... Um, okay, so to, to, be, to be quite honest about reticulocyte hemoglobin content, there are certain contexts within which we have not fully studied this, and this would be one of them. Um, we are busy with a, with a study. We've actually just completed data collection on uh, pregnant patients where we do the antenatal um, iron studies, hemoglobin plus reticulocyte hemoglobin content, because I want to see how well this performs in our local context. So, but yes, in theory, I can't see why it shouldn't give you the answer. Um, although if you're talking about a hyperacute bleed, you will probably, sorry, you will probably not see the answer if it's an acute bleed that just happened in the last day or two. You'd still need those reticular sites mm. to be produced that did not have available iron for them, for their development. So not that good in an acute bleed. Yeah. Okay, so I think that we need to wrap up now. Um, thank you very much for everybody's interaction and for using the chat box. I'd like to just remind you that the feedback is so important. So please share your feedback um, on the link that I've just posted and it's been posted a couple of time be times before. 
Thank you, Vernon, for your time and for just always going the extra mile and making your presentation so interactive and brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Claire, for your chair chairpersonship and for agreeing immediately to do it. It was really very <laughs> kind of you. And from my side, thanks to the ECHO project and Chris and Cheryl and everyone that organizes. Really thankful for the invitation. Thank you. And thanks also, like again, to ECHO New Mexico and the ECHO India team. Um, we also want to remind you that there are recordings available and that will be on the Gastro Foundation website. So please visit that website. Um, thank you so much to the Gastro Foundation as a body, but especially to Cheryl and Karen for all the behind the scenes work and the millions of emails and organizing and making sure that this hour is an hour that is maximally, maximally used without glitches. Thank you. What you do is really so valuable. Yeah, and thank you to the sponsors, um, not to be named, but thank you for everybody who makes this, this talk work. And next week, um, the topic is um, pathology and that is shared up on the screen. So please take that and copy it and share it with all your colleagues that would like to join next week for the pathology ses session. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Vernon. Thanks, thank everyone. you very much. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.